FASB accounting change is going to be a big catalyst. The first public company, which I think has a chance on the other side of this uh, hyper Bitcoinization event horizon to be one of the biggest companies in the world. There's never been a public company on a gold standard. Why? When has a public company ever said, all oh, our goal is to acquire as much gold as possible? Even the gold bugs are passing out dividends in dollars. Why aren't gold companies stacking gold in the balance sheet and diluting their equity to buy gold? If you're able to borrow fiat for 2% for seven years to buy an asset that's appreciating by X percent over the next seven years, these banks are going to figure out once they can custody it themselves that Bitcoin is the best collateral. Over collateralized Bitcoin lending is a zero loss business, but that's been misconstrued by years of crypto schemes and counterparty risk and rehypothecation. The recovery rate for an over collateralized Bitcoin loan is 100% and the time to liquidate is 10 minutes. That Bitcoin is no longer just this little bubble that kids are playing with in the side pool. Bitcoin is the real game. Bitcoin slowly just kind of Trojan horsing its way onto the asset side of the global balance sheet. The volatility is it's not a bug, it's a feature. It's a tool to be leveraged. The wealthy don't sell assets, they just borrow against them. The exchange rate of Bitcoin is like the, the alarm bell. In a world where Bitcoin is 100 times larger, if Congress says, oh, you know, we, we, we thought we were going to run 1% uh, deficits this year, we're going to run 10% deficits. Bitcoin moons. If you think about what JD Vance and Trump's platform is, we need to reshore manufacturing, we need to weaken the dollar, and they're also bull posting about Bitcoin. Those things aren't unrelated. Uh, the Harris administration doesn't stop Bitcoin from yeah. reaching six figures plus. What do you think will be the impact of a company adopting uh, Bitcoin? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's been four years. Uh, the, the playbook is, is entirely vindicated. Um, MicroStrategy is the, you know, it's outperformed every S&P 500 company um, since its adoption, including like tech darlings like NVIDIA. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's, it started off and Sailor says this, and it started off as a defensive strategy, you know, the COVID inflation, money printing, 0% interest rates, you know, we need a hedge, you evaluate gold stocks, real estate, passive index investing, um, buying back your own shares, um, which is certainly was part of the, the calculus for them for micro strategy. It's basically what everyone else does. Right. Um, it's like, you know, we don't want to hold the, the melting ice cube as, as, as it was said. What do we do? Well, uh, you know, just I guess we can artificially pump our earnings. Uh, maybe, we, maybe we debt finance it and uh, get a bit of leverage and really, really, you know, goose the earnings per share. Um, but, you know, they bought some Bitcoin instead at you know, nine, ten thousand, eleven thousand dollars um, dollars You know, proceed, that was before the kind of this kind of crazy bull market. Um, and quickly it turned from a, from a defensive strategy to an offensive strategy. Um, so, you know, debt, fi debt financed uh, Bitcoin purchases, equity dilution, convertible notes, which is still, I think, this very misunderstood um, strategy they're implementing, um, which is, you know, borrow borrowing money for five or six years. You're, you're blending, you know, almost this like this, this equity call option on your own common stock. You're like selling volatility mm. of your of you're selling leveraged bitcoin volatility mm. to buy more bitcoin um you know you or me can't do that we don't we can't print uh print our own shares um but but for a corporation for a public company you can um and so you know really i think it started off as just an exemplary hey you know you can have this as a portfolio diversifier um and it transitioned into I think this is the the best thing to own out of out of every asset in the world, um, and and eventually you know this is going this is, I mean it already is for MicroStrategy and for me for me and you Bitcoin is the benchmark, um, but for for the world of, for the world of finance now you know they're looking at they're looking at the dollar as a benchmark or maybe the the you know passive performance of the S P five hundred as a as a benchmark, um, and so. You know, I think that that corporate adoption is happening. Uh, the FASB accounting get, uh, change is going to be a, a, a big, big catalyst. We've already seen a few companies adopt it. Um, like, you know, one of the things that uh, that isn't really understood or I didn't understand is how much of the, you know, the the uh, intangible accounting uh, uh, treatment or framework of, of Bitcoin today or in the past was like a. Uh, a disincentive to adopt, right? Where your earnings per share could only go down as a result of Bitcoin going down, but they couldn't get, uh, couldn't ratchet up. Um, so I think that's, you know, f maybe for someone like Michael Saylor or for me and you, 
or running a public company, it you know, whatever, doesn't matter. But for anyone that's incentivized by earnings um, or, you know, kind of these like whatever, whatever benchmarks um, for your quarterly or annual reports, um, that was a big, a big disincentive. Um, and so, yeah, I think that this we're still in the super early phase. I would have expected it to happen sooner. Um, but, you know, four years into MicroStrategy, I think there's, you know, probably 50 public companies globally with a lit, at some, you know, some Bitcoin exposure. I think there's only a handful of public companies that are truly, um, you know, following MicroStrategy, starting to, to actually, you know, go on a full Bitcoin standard. Um, even some of the miners, right? They're on like a hash rate standard. Hmm. You know, they're on an ASIC standard. Um, if you look at it in Bitcoin per share terms, basically, I think there's only one or one or two miners out of 20 plus publicly traded miners that have added Bitcoin per share over a, over a three, four year period. Um, may, there may not be any, um, but I, I saw Cathedra Bitcoin put out a, a report where they, they've transitioned from like, or transitioning from prop mining, ASICs, you know, trying to get as much hash rate as possible to mine, which is a brutal business, the difficulty adjustment, just brutal, um, to more of more hosting, which is like kind of steady fiat cash flows, not, not levered Bitcoin exposure, Bitcoin derivative exposure in the form of ASICs and, and being long hash rate, you know, it's just like this global arms race. Um, and instead thinking about it in Bitcoin per share terms of, okay, cash flow into Bitcoin, you know, use Bitcoin as collateral, maybe more infrastructure, buy more Bitcoin. And if it doesn't increase Bitcoin per share terms, if it doesn't increase, you know, if it's not Bitcoin positive, then you, you don't do it. And, and just the alternative is just sitting and acquiring more Bitcoin. Um, hmm. And so I, th I think that's really interesting. Um, we're still er super early days, uh, but I think there's a, there's a really good chance that 20 years out, maybe not even that, you know, that far away, that this is like the ultimate finance case study. And it was like, you know, the first, the first, you know, public company, um, which I think, you know, has a chance on the other side of this, uh, you know, Bitcoin is hyper Bitcoinization event horizon to be one of the biggest companies in the world, um, you know, and, and really be a model for, for every other, uh, forward thinking firm and maybe every, every other firm eventually on the planet, um, as, as what, you know, what is my benchmark? What is the ultimate, like, how am I measuring performance? Cause right now a lot, a lot of quote unquote performance or earnings or growth in, in the stock market isn't growth at all. It's, it's, you know, this like this fake buyback, you know, adjusted performance or, you know, all of this like fiat accounting gimmicks and, um, you know, the hard, hard money as a benchmark, uh, absolute scarcity. These are, these are very novel concepts. Um, and, you know, even, even on a gold standard or even, you know, the, the fact that gold is this $10 trillion asset that's, that's been around for m millennia. Um, there's never been a public company on a gold standard. Why? Right. When has a public company ever said all our goal is to acquire as much gold as possible? Even the gold bugs, <laughs> even the gold bugs are passing out dividends in dollars, right? Mm. The gold, the gold miners are literally paying out dividend, paying taxes, paying out dividends to their investors who receive dividends and pay taxes as income. Why aren't gold, why aren't gold companies stacking gold in the balance sheet and diluting their equity to buy gold? Why, wh and why, why is that? Um, so this is very radical. Um, it flips the entire corporate world on its head. And I think most people are just seeing it as, as dumb luck still, um, which is fascinating. You know, a, a $500 million enterprise value goes to 40 billion in, in four years. Like where, where have you ever seen that? Um, mm. with no fundamental change outside of, you know, your accounting unit, um, you know, and a, and a, you know, corporate treasury team of 10 people. Like one of the most eye-opening things that I had had, and I was already, you know, intimately familiar with what, what was happening and the mechanics behind it. Um, but I was at the, the MicroStrategy event, um, in Bitcoin for Corporations in, in um, May. We were just talking to some people on their team. And, um, you know, one of the insights that was shared um, was, you know, they, like there's uh, one of the members of the team was like, there's, there's 1,900 employees at MicroStrategy. Um, 18 and 1,890 of them are working around the clock, uh, you know, 24, seven, 365, uh, to turn out, you know, what, what is it? 20, 20, 30, 40, $50 million of, of profit a year. Um, which is great. You know, that's like, you know, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, you know, business intelligence, software services. 
um, 10 pull, the, the 10 people on the Bitcoin team raise one convertible note issuance um, for 500 or a billion, you know, maybe let's say a billion dollars um, at 2% a year for six years at a, at a 40% conversion to the current share price. And that, that, you know, that's a creative in Bitcoin terms or, you know, just in terms of the, the, their, you know, enterprise value and, you know, 10 times over in, in, in a week, what the entire rest of the company, and that's not a slight at the rest of the company right, at all. It's, that's more just saying that, you know, the fact that you're able to borrow fiat for 2% for seven years to buy an asset that's appreciating by X percent over the next seven years and you know, and you're selling your stock at a premium. You're diluting oh. your shares. The shares are a thousand dollars today, or a hundred dollars today. You're selling shares at a future price of fourteen hundred dollars, or one hundred forty dollars, right? So, like this Bitcoin per share accretive dilution concept, the fact that they're selling, you know, they're they're selling their stock volatility, they're selling their stock at a future premium. It would be accretive on a Bitcoin per share basis, even if the stock traded one for one with their Bitcoin holdings. People are like, oh, once the premium collapses, it's done. It's like, no, no, they could do the same thing and, and accrete Bitcoin per share with the stock trading at 10 billion and their Bitcoin being worth 10 billion and the software business being worth nothing. They could do the same thing. Um, so I think like they, I mean, the, the, expecting every company to ado adopt the sailor strategy and like going all in, a little bit over advantageous. Um, but expecting every company in the next 10 years to have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin and that 1% going to 5% or 10% eventually is like, is a strong bet. Um, and, I, and I think that we're just still in the super early phases of it. The fact that like there are a few employees that do the big Bitcoin strategy uh, reminded me of a quote, I think it was Warren Buffett, maybe Charlie Munger, maybe someone else. Uh, it's better to think about money uh, one hour long than work for uh, money one hour long. Uh, and, and it's really interesting, I think, that that's a fear thing i feel like it, it's like if we come to a bitcoin world uh where like bitcoin is actually the standard like decades into the future maybe hundreds of years in the future uh, whenever this this world comes then we're like in this world where like you just put proof of work in mm -hmm. uh, and you adopt the bitcoin standard uh and and then maybe that that thing is not true anymore yep. that you can do with, with leverage and, and the, those fiat games just like pulling up the the revenue from the next like 10 years and like have this bitcoin already now uh that's like a, a massive fiat game it's, it's really interesting to, to see um but right now we are in this uh phase where the bitcoin uh companies have bitcoin and they're putting on the balance sheet then we have some companies like microstrategy and others that have put bitcoin on the balance sheet uh how do you envision like the the next few years uh, of of adopting bitcoin maybe also with the fastb rule mm -hmm. uh, that is coming now and uh, the bitcoin df that we already had uh, in, in in the past now uh, and now kind of like it, it feels like we we built like a bucket uh, uh, where money can flow in and everything is kind of evolved around that and everything is getting ready i think mm -hmm. it, like Mike Azalea even had like those, those three points with the fast pay rules with mm -hmm. like uh, banks uh, allowing Bitcoin custody and stuff like that. And we are coming closer to those three points reaching the things. Yep. Um, how fundamental is that for like the, the, the coming five, 10 years? Yeah, I, um, I, mean, I think it's huge. Um, a lot of, you know, maybe some people, and I, and I understand it um, from like the cypherpunk or anarchist perspective are saying like, Oh, you're celebrating the banks or, you know, public companies or, you know, BlackRock buying, you know, buying Bitcoin on behalf of their clients. And, and for me, it was kind of I, I always thought it was inevitable. And that doesn't I don't think that takes away from the the gray market, black market, cypherpunk privacy, you know, like all everybody that's working on, you know, e-cash and second layer privacy solutions and and, you know, all this other stuff doesn't doesn't take away from any of this, like the other stuff happening doesn't stop that, take away from it. I think it actually puts more of a financial incentive upon all of the other stuff. Um, but in terms of, yeah, like you have, you have things coming down the pipe, you have uh, FASB, which has been adopted by a few companies that are first movers. Um, MicroStrategy will probably be Q1, I would say. Um, you have the, the Bitcoin ETF options, um, which yes, you know, I, you could say it's a fiat, you know, fiat games. Um, but the fact that, you know, the lo the thing that's been said the most about Bitcoin as a, as a, you know, the detractors would say it's too volatile and it doesn't produce cash flow. You know, those are the things that like you can't, 
you know, that, that it's, we can invest in this, right? And there's gonna be products, there's gonna be synthetic products in, you know, week two of, of these, you know, um, ETF options rolling out where you can hold the, you know, income strategy IBIT ETF and it gives you Bitcoin performance, um, but on the upside, you don't, you, you, you don't gain as much. And on the downside, it doesn't perform as poorly and you get a di- you get a dividend uh, you know check every every month, right? Because this ETF is structurally just selling call options, selling call options, selling call options. And I understand that's not Bitcoin in cold storage. That there's no sovereignty component of that. That's not you know that's not like this uh, you know radical like th- that's more you know the quote unquote fiat games. But the the thing is that there there is tr- ten, tens of trillions, hundreds of trillions of dollars in this like fixed income fiat world, right? And so if we're gonna expect a hundred billion dollars or a trillion dollars to flow into Bitcoin products, right? Uh, you know, which would create, you know, X trillions of dollars of market cap, then, you know, stuff that, that leverages Bitcoin's volatility, that leverages Bitcoin's uncertainty and turns that into, you know, to an income stream um, is, is a valuable product and people are gonna undoubtedly use it. Right. So for instance, there's this MSTR is like is MicroStrategy and is up 200 percent this year. MSTY is a structured product that does that's not affiliated like MicroStrategy didn't uh, wasn't involved with this. It was a third party. Um, And they this they're this uh, yield max. They're this um, uh, uh, fund or this um, uh, entity on Wall Street that takes all, you know, NVIDIA and Apple and Tesla and big companies and then they put it into a, a product and then they sell call options. They're, they're selling covered calls. And so, you know, if, if it's the price of a share is a hundred bucks and I sell a $120 call and the price goes to 140, well, I'm still stuck with exposure at 120. I left up some upside, but if it's flat or if it's down, you're, you're selling, you're selling insurance, you're selling call options that expire worthless every mm-hmm. single week, every single, every single month. Right. And so this MSTY product is like a hundred percent annualized and I know technically it's not like a fixed income product with a fixed coupon it's it's variable but so you can't technically say annualized yield uh, but this this MSTY product because MSTR is so volatile is is spinning off a crazy amount of of uh, income right and so all of a sudden these ibit options turn bitcoin from and I, I, for me or you buy spot bitcoin for for really anybody that's interested in in uh, you know just saving for their future, just buy spot Bitcoin, hold it in cold storage. But for like the baby boomer that's like needs to live on his retirement and, or, you know, whatever it may be, like they, they have a different sort of profile, right? Like, I, sorry, I need an income. I can't, I can't put all of my money into Bitcoin. Um, something like that is, is, is going to be utilized. And I, I think that um, these are all super interesting things. So I think the, the bank custody is going to unlock a ton, uh, a ton of just, continued institutional adoption as, as IBIT has become the best performing ETF, um, in history, not, not in performance, but in terms of, uh, you know, AUM to start. Um, I think there's been a lot of institutional cover, right? Like there was career risk for what Saylor did. He was a billionaire. He was the longest tenured CEO in the NASDAQ. He didn't care, you know, he, like he, I think he said he was going to just wrap it up and mm. call it, call it quits, retire and, you know, just hang out in Miami beach every, every day for the rest. He didn't, he didn't really care career risk to him that, I mean, he, he started this company from, from nothing, wrote it up to, you know, multi billion dollar wealth in the dot com bubble. And then literally MicroStrategy went down 99%, 99.9%. And he stuck with it for 20 years, career risk, you know, who cares for him? But for a lot of people, like they're not running the company they started. There's, there's a, a ton of career risk, you know, oh, you, you adopted that thing that's a Ponzi scheme with no income. What are you doing? You know, you're a, you're a software company. You're a medical device company. What, what are you thinking? Um, but I bet Larry Fink coming out and saying like, you know, Bitcoin is uh, bigger than any government. And it's like this, this, is, this took out the institutional like career risk. Um, the banks, the banks, you know, custodying Bitcoin, I think was always a natural um, development. Um, I think, you know, probably not soon, but eventually these banks are going to figure out once they can custody it themselves, that Bitcoin is the best collateral that there's, there's no, there's no world where you should, you know, borrowing against Bitcoin over collateralized, you know, I give you $2 of Bitcoin and you give me a dollar of dollars. Um, um, 
that there's no world that that should be, uh, you know, 10, 11, 12, 15% interest rate as it's been throughout the last, you know, three, four, five years. Um, when that's, that's a risk-free loan, right? It's not risk-free in, in Bitcoin terms. You wouldn't lend me dollars because you have no interest in lending dollars. Um, but the banks do, that's their job. And so, you know, the, like, I don't think people realize if, if I have $20 million of S&P 500 shares and I'm, you know, I'm a uh, private client at Goldman Sachs, I can borrow against my shares of stock for the, you know, so for the Fed funds rate plus 50 bips plus, you know, I can borrow if the if risk-free rate, risk-free rate is, is 5%, I can borrow for, let's just call it 6% but for 1% over the risk-free rate. And the bank's happy because they have collateral to make sure that they would never ever lose money on that deal. They're just, they're just taking a 1% interest rate and it's free money for them. There's no reason Bitcoin shouldn't be the same. And I would argue it will be the same, right? Over-collateralized Bitcoin lending is a zero loss business, but that's been misconstrued by years of crypto schemes and, and altcoins and counterparty risk and rehypothecation. Or like unchained capital has been uh, utilizing over collateralized Bitcoin loans since I believe 2017. They've underwritten, um, or they're not underwriting, but they've provided a few hundred million dollars, which isn't a lot, but it's it's a lot for me and you. A uh, hundred, couple hundred million dollars of of loans against uh, clients who take Bitcoin. Unchained doesn't rehypothecate it. They actually, you know, if if you are the one borrowing and you pledge your Bitcoin, you get one key of three in a multi sig. Unchain keeps a key and, the, and another third party keeps a key. And so uh, in the case that Bitcoin falls 50% or 60% or whatever, they, they tap you on the shoulder, you know, and say, hey, put up more Bitcoin, put up more Bitcoin, you know, just letting you know your collateral is running low. If it falls enough and you don't put up any more collateral, they do margin call. They do make sure that, you know, once, once they're, you know, $2 of Bitcoin against their $1 of, of Lent, um, funds, you know, once your collateral goes to a dollar twenty or a dollar ten, they will liquidate it because they're not they're not interested in taking a loss, right? But as a result, they've their loan book has had zero defaults, mm. right? And so, like, if you think of the world of like, if you think of the world of interest rates, uh, like of, of of lending, right? Um, interest rates are a compensation for for the risk, right? There's a reason that credit cards are 20 25 percent, right? Because it's unsecured. And a certain amount of borrowers rack up credit card debt and then, you know, disappear. <laughs> they don't pay it, right? And so the, the banks, the lenders have to bake in a default rate, right? Automobile loans, right? Well, if you don't pay, then they're going to repo your car, but the car's depreciated, it's banged up, maybe it's gone missing, you know, the engine's gone. Like there's, there's all these things. With a, with, a, with a mortgage, they can repo your house, right? But it takes a year. There's this whole process. So the recovery rate... Um, is one thing to think about. And then also like the time to liquidate. The recovery rate for an over collateralized Bitcoin loan is 100%. And the, and, the, and the time to liquidate is 10 minutes. You know, like, like, and so the, that, the banks adopting Bitcoin as you know, custody, they're not coming out and saying, we're offering over collateralized Bitcoin loans to everybody. But when Cantor Fitzgerald says, hey, we have $2 billion of, of financing for anybody interested in borrowing against their Bitcoin. You know, Cantor, like that's that's a big deal. And so all these banks coming in and eventually custodying Bitcoin, you best believe that Bitcoin gets entrenched further into the the world of, you know, of Wall Street, into the world of of finance. And so that many people would think like this is a bad thing. And I would say that this is always an after progression. Bitcoin in this world becomes increasingly tied to liquidity, to global liquidity. It becomes increasingly correlated to the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ and all these risk assets and inversely correlated to the dollar. And I would say that, you know, eventually, if we, if we walk this path forward, Bitcoin is what, trillion and a half now. If it gets 10 times bigger to 15 trillion, wherever, uh, you know, you can be a lot higher or maybe a little lower. Think about what, what that means in the case of a 40, 50, 60, 70 percent drawdown. Hmm. Think about what that means. It means that Bitcoin is no longer just this little bubble you know, that, that kids are playing with in the side pool, right? Like Bitcoin is the, is the real, real game. And, and what happens every single time there's a meaningful drawdown in household wealth and, in, 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 you know, and anytime there's an asset bubble that goes burst with sufficient size, 
2000 tech bubble, housing bubble, GFC, like sovereign debt, there's always a bailout. And it's, that's not, it's not a bailout because they, they want to, it's because they have to. It's because global solvency with all this debt, once assets start to liquidate and there's this compounding, this compounding feedback loop, the, the world is functionally insolvent. And so what do they do? They print a bunch of money, buy up all the, the toxic assets and reinflate. And so b the banks custodying Bitcoin and, you know, to a certain extent, like also the, you know, just FASB accounting and all this other stuff on the corporate side, but Bitcoin slowly just kind of Trojan horsing its way onto the asset side of the global balance sheet is absolutely a bullish, bullish sign. Um, and it's just, I think the natural progression of everything. Um, and uh, yeah, I think so. So while that's not like stated right away outright, it's not like, oh, uh, they're adopting you know, Bitcoin to custody and they're also going to be offering financing collateral. If you don't think that's coming, you don't understand like mm. why they are so interested in this in the first place. Um, because they, they, I mean, they, they've seen the BlackRock ETF shatter records. They know where this is all going. They're, I think this, the savvy ones are slowly starting to wake up to this, this fact uh, and they don't want to be left behind. Um, so I think I'm super bullish on it all. Um, I think the, the corporate story is super interesting um, and, and still extremely misunderstood. Um, and, and Bitcoin's volatility is one of the things that unlocks all of this stuff. Um, and, and that's people are starting to realize, especially in the case of like sailor strategy, that the volatility is not a it's not a bug. It's a feature and it's a, mm. it's a tool to be leveraged. Yeah, absolutely. And. And I think uh, whenever we are talking about corporate leverage and, and all those uh, games that are played uh, on that level, I think we have to at least quickly also talk about that same thing on the individual level on yep. uh, the, the normal people that have maybe like 0.1 Bitcoin, maybe they even have like three or four Bitcoin, uh, a little bit more than that. Uh, but they don't have like a massive multi-billion dollar <laughs> company like mm -hmm. MicroStrategy and all those things. Is in th their case uh, a leverage, no matter how big or small uh, that is, in any way uh, sense like it may, does that make sense to even adopt like uh, credits on on an individual basis for Bitcoin? Maybe like you see like especially now with the expected bull run the next like 12 to 18 months. Like okay, I can buy now so many Bitcoin in 18 months. Probably I can buy just like a, a fraction of that Bitcoin. Why not take like a 20,000 euro loan or like 50,000 euro loan and buy Bitcoin now with that and just buy, uh, just pay off the debt uh, within the next like 12 or 18 months. Uh, is there anything to it or is the, are most people better off just like buying spot Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I would say be, be weary uh, uh, or careful on anything that, you know, puts your Bitcoin at risk, right? So we're talking about Bitcoin as collateral loans just five minutes ago. Um, you know, the, the wealthy don't sell assets, never sell assets. Um, they just borrow against them, right? So you're not going to sell your $20 million of S&P 500 stock. If you need a five, $5 million, you're just going to borrow against it. Um, you're not going to, you know, I think Seller said this multiple times, like you're not going to, you never sell your block of Manhattan real estate. You just finance against it to buy the next one. Um, you, you know, you don't, you shouldn't sell your Bitcoin, um, but you also shouldn't be ever put yourself in a spot where you're forced to sell the Bitcoin, not because you want to, but because you have two Bitcoin and you, you, you know, Bitcoin $60,000 and you put those two Bitcoin, all your, your entire stack into, uh, an app or a bank a Neo bank, and you borrowed 60,000 USD, uh, and you, and you maybe bought another Bitcoin or did whatever with it. And all of a sudden, you know, there's this COVID style crash and Bitcoin goes from 60,000 just briefly to 30, 34,000. And, and just to preface this, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen here, but just, just for the sake of the hypothetical scenario. And that's in that case, Bitcoin could have, could have been to that level just for three minutes and never returned again. Yet you were forced to sell everything at 34,000 or 30 or whatever that was because you had a liquidation and you got tapped on the shoulder by that app and they said, Hey, please send more Bitcoin or else like, you know, we have no choice. This was, a, this was the agreement because they, they are, have zero interest in, in taking directional exposure. They're just taking, you know, they're just loaning you. And, and, you know, if you don't put up the collateral, then that's their job. Um, and so in that scenario, right, like you were bullish on Bitcoin, you get the thesis, you get everything right. 
you even stacked more Bitcoin with your Bitcoin. Like that's the intention. And then you were forced to sell everything at the low. Right. And so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of, there's plenty of people that have like horror stories like that. I mean, there's similarly like, you know, that, that story can be summed up by people trading leverage on Binance. Right. I, I wouldn't encourage that for anybody. Um, but you know, it's, it's one thing if you have a ton of cash flow, a ton of assets, you're super solvent and you take a 10th of, of your stack or a hundredth of your stack and you, you know, borrow against it. So you don't have to sell anything. Right. And you can, you know, use that, you can use a little bit of that collateral to, you know, um, purchase a home or do whatever. Right. And, and, and you know, that even if Bitcoin goes down 80%, there's not a, there's not one world out there where you would ever have to be, you know, forcibly sell everything at the worst time. Um, but on the other hand, I would say their dollars currency is fungible. Um, you on your balance sheet, it's all fungible. And so if you're, if you're, you know, there's many people out there, um, that have, let's just say in the U S, um, that have a two and a half percent mortgage for 20, 26 more years. Right. People say, don't borrow against your Bitcoin or don't borrow to buy Bitcoin. Okay, fine. Conventional wisdom. It's too volatile. It's risky. Don't borrow to buy Bitcoin. Fine. Well, if, if I'm sitting here and I have a, a two and a half percent mortgage for $500,000 and I have, you know, a house that uh, I have against that, um, and I buy Bitcoin with my cash, like I have on my balance sheet, I have a house, I have Bitcoin and I have a $500,000 mortgage. My trade-off of buying that Bitcoin was paying off the mortgage, paying off that principal, right? So you're not borrowing to buy Bitcoin, but you indirectly are. Like mm -hmm. you have credit card debt and student loans and on your asset side, you have Bitcoin and bank account cash. Like you, you didn't borrow to buy Bitcoin explicitly, but dollars are fungible, so you did, right? And so like the calculus, and I, I would, you know, like definitely not a 25% credit card rate, but if you have, let's just say like 5% student loan debt, right? And that's, you know, eating away at you, and, you know, and, and you know that this is, this is unsecured and you have to pay it off eventually. Um, but it could be meaningful or not, you know, if you, if you just buy Bitcoin with a DCA for five bucks a day, like you are indirectly borrowing to buy Bitcoin. You don't realize it. It's not, it's not, you're not putting your Bitcoin as collateral, which is even, you know, even better. Um, but that's, you know, that's, indirectly unofficially what's happening you are quite literally like speculative attacking the dollar you have a leveraged balance sheet to buy bitcoin right so like again that i don't think every you should i'm not encouraging anybody to borrow money to buy bitcoin um but if you have a mortgage and you own bitcoin you've you've borrowed money to buy bitcoin your trade-off to buying that bitcoin was paying off your mortgage you didn't you didn't do that in full um so i think there's smart there's smart leverage i don't think when when the 30-year debt you know 30-year rate in the u.s is four percent this is outside of Bitcoin. It makes no sense to pay off more than, than just bare minimum on your two and a half percent mortgage. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, if you, if you know, if you have a, any sort of debt out there that, you know, reasonably, you, you know, you can service if you need to, you're not, you're not strained in a position where like you're buying Bitcoin so much that you're going to nuke your credit score or all of your personal finances. Otherwise or you get your, your house or your car repossessed. Um, but, you know, if, if you're evaluating the trade-off and you, and you know that, let's just say it's unsecured debt and, you know, this, this interest rate's 5% and you're, you have some, some level of confidence, whether irrational or not, that Bitcoin might outpace 5% a year for the next X amount of, of, of a period of time, you know, that's, that's an opportunity cost or a, a decision everybody has to make. But I mean, I've certainly made that decision in the past and, and I think, you know, most people have without even knowing it maybe. Right. Um, I think it, it, you know, in a, especially in a world where like, if we ever see what we kind of expect to happen over what's already happened, but also over the next five or 10 years, like that will be a, a good decision. I mean, people, people in hyperinflationary periods, the people that get rich or get even, you know, are already rich and get way richer are the people that are short the devaluing currency and long any hard assets like in Weimar, Germany, all these industrialists got filthy rich because they were they they took they borrowed every single mark they could and bought gold or factories or whatever it was. Um, so I think like 
it is entirely different when we're talking about microstrategy or we're talking about the corporate level. Um, it's entirely different to, you know, borrowing as a, as a public company with, with liquid common stock versus an individual. Um, for instance, Meta Planet borrowed a billion yen, which is like $7 million, um, twice, one, one for one year and one for six months. Um, and has, has paid down the six month loan with, uh, with an issuance of, of stock acquisition rights. Um, you know, there's a $10 billion issuance of stock acquisition rights. Um, a bunch of that went to buying Bitcoin. One of that went to paying down some of the debt, right? So, you know, I, I can't issue shares of Dylan. You can't issue shares of Rob. Like you, we, mm. that's, that's not a, that's not something that can be done. A micro strategy at book, if it's trading at 10 billion and it's Bitcoin is worth 10 billion, they can dilute common stock. Bitcoin per share won't go up because it's trading at one to one, but their debt solvency ratio is improved. So the dilution, even even at a at a point, if with the valuation where Bitcoin per share is not going anywhere, it's flat. Aggregate Bitcoin's increasing, and and your debt ratios are improving. Your sol- your solvency ratios are improving. So it's not just a Bitcoin per share thing. It's also this 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 kind of this game with like solvency, right? It's like the interest the interest payment, but also in the in the case of liquidation, you know how much how many assets do you have to cover your liabilities? So I think that the calculus for an individual has to be different than a public company um, or, you know, an institution. But, um, you know, I would say outside of just pledging all of your Bitcoin to borrow, there, there, is, there is smart leverage, um, and, you know, especially for the people with like, you know, a, a house maybe that's fully paid off or, or you know, how, this long mortgage, right? That, that is... Borrowing to buy Bitcoin. It's just a, mm-hmm. kind of a roundabout way to think about it. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code ROBIN at the checkout. Visit Bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to have the most secure self-custody setup you have to secure your own devices you have to protect your privacy you have to set up an inheritance plan and depending on where you live you even want to have a plan b a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the Bitcoin Way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much it's also interesting um, that we can utilize that fiat game to make Bitcoin and the Bitcoin community stronger. And basically, that's that's what MicroStrategy is doing, what, what all the companies are doing. Uh, they are pulling from fiat to Bitcoin. It's like the, 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 the dark uh, uh, dark hole, the, 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 the hole that comes yep. in fiat and makes Bitcoin stronger. Um, let's zoom out really, really far. Um, like, first of all, do you think that fiat games will always be there? Is, is, is fiat always something that will be with us? Or is at some point uh, Bitcoin, the, the world reserve currency asset, and those games is just like a very long transition phase where we transition from like fiat to, to mm-hmm. Bitcoin standard maybe? 
Or is it just that we have Bitcoin as this exit valve that we can flee to, mm-hmm. but fiat will always be there, the, those uh, credit markets will always mm-hmm. be there. Uh, once we get to like, oh no, Bitcoin is just not a $1 trillion asset, but it's like a, a 200, 400 trillion, like a really mm-hmm. big asset. Um, where maybe just it's the only uh, currency or asset like that. Um, how does it look then? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to note that we, a lot of the stuff we're talking about with micro strategy, I think and they would even, I'm sure they've even said it, sailors even said it, I'm sure they would state it again, that this, they, they know a lot of this is like a temporary phase transition, right? It's like, it's like this arbitrage on uh, the transition state. Mm. Um, you know, I don't think there, if, we, if we're 50 years from in the future, I don't think there will just be like, I, I don't think it's fair to say a money glitch, but I, 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 I don't think there's just this world where you can just like print common stock, buy Bitcoin, and it's just like this, this feedback loop um, that, that no one else has caught up on. Um, I think that, you know, eventually Bitcoin gets so large and, and the, all of this stuff becomes so understood and people understand more particularly because this is an arbitrage on basically the cost of capital. Right, Bitcoin doesn't have an interest rate, but it's this proof of work, you know, uh, uh, this that's you know ever ratcheting up production cost, marginal production cost with the difficulty adjustment and proof of work mining, um, and with absolute scarcity that you know against this centrally controlled system that has a cost of capital that may or may not outpace the inflation rate, right? And so it's this is kind of like this this phase transition arbitrage. If we're thinking about 50 years from now, I think that, um, you know, if, if you asked me four years ago in 2020, um, as I once I, I really got the, th- the thesis and I read The Sovereign Individual and a bunch of these books and I was like, all right, you know, fiat has a few years left, <laughs> you know, at best. Um, and I would say that that was, um, you know, I, I don't I no longer believe that. But at the same time, I think that, um, you know, fiat will be around for a long time, but not in its current state of importance. Um, hmm. And I say that as in. And this isn't the best analogy, but may, maybe it works. Um, for, like basically every other currency in the world except the dollar, um, but you know a lot of the G7 currencies and even a lot of the emerging market currencies are basically more or less like dollar derivatives, right? And you know when the Fed says jump, they say how high. Um, and you know if the Fed cuts or the Fed loosens, then you know they're more or less following, and their inflation is isn't even their own domestic economies, inflation, it's basically just global inflation. And they're kind of at the whims of everything else. Um, and really, it's like the dollar capital markets, the USD capital markets, and the Fed, and our rates that set that set not only their their currency, but their rates too, right? I think we get to a world where Bitcoin, if we're thinking about it as $100 trillion, $200 trillion, fiat could still exist. The, I would, I'm much more confident in the dollar than I am of the euro. Um, as a as a kind of currency block with all these nations that are supposedly sovereign, kind of pegged to this like, you know, um, you know EU authority. So I I don't I don't I wouldn't with confidence say that the euro in its current state is is out you know uh, two decades from now. Um, but uh, you know the USD I could certainly see a world where uh, Bitcoin it's a store of value asset. It's 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 increasingly being used maybe in, in developing markets and in, in Western worlds as a medium of exchange and unit of account by, um, by companies or individuals. Um, but the dollar is still exists, um, but is, is restrained in a way that it's not today. Deficit spending by politicians is, is restrained or constrained by the reality that they know. Like right now, Congress doesn't think twice. They don't blink about another $100 billion of foreign aid, of of another, you know, trillion dollars of military spending, of, of you know, entitlements, welfare, whatever it is, write it off. Um, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Rack up another trillion in debt. Who cares? Who's counting? Um, in a world where Bitcoin is, is not a trillion, but is, is two orders of magnitude larger, is $100 trillion, every single, and I think it's already, there's already savvy people, there's already the people watching this podcast and me and you who are saying, Oh, they just issued another trillion in debt. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I should value my Bitcoin higher mentally, right? Um, in dollar terms. Um, I think that once Bitcoin gets to sufficient size, every, and, and, you know, you have maybe let's say 10 companies or 100 companies 
doing what, what MicroStrategy is doing at size, at massive size. And you have hedge funds like, you know, and, and people like Ray Dalio and Paul Tudor Jones and Stanley Druckenmiller that are, that are going to their Goldman private, you know, financing and saying, you know, give me, I'm borrowing $500 million to do what? No, buy, buy Bitcoin. Um, and you have like, like this is happening at a massive scale and banks are utilizing Bitcoin as collateral. And like, you know, basically what we went, were talking about 15 minutes ago on, on Bitcoin as collateral entrenching itself in that world, the dollar, like Bitcoin is the check, right? Bitcoin, the exchange rate of Bitcoin is like the, the alarm bell. And it, we, we would say it already is, but it's not sufficient size to truly, to truly matter yet. Um, versus in, in a world where Bitcoin is a hundred times larger, if Congress says, oh, you know, we, we, we thought we were going to run uh, 1% deficits this year, we're going to run 10% deficits. Mm. Bitcoin moons, like on that, on that day, right? It's like, you know, in the same way that, you know, mar like when markets are forward looking and, you know, when, when the Fed governor, you know, changes his tune or comes out in a different color tie and markets go up or down and react and, or like, oh, there's a, there's a 50 basis point cut and everyone, <laughs> everyone expected a 25 basis point cut. And so the Nasdaq's up 2% and, and then Bitcoin's up and the dollar's down and interest rates are whatever, right? Like if we think of a world where Bitcoin, like the dollar can still exist. The dollar can still be, a, you know, everybody could be using it and maybe they're forcibly mandated to get, pay, to get paid in it and pay taxes in it. Who knows? Um, but the, the, the reckless deficit spending and, and all the stuff that we just kind of accept as, as the state of affairs today would be, by definition, constrained by the fact that everybody knows that, that this is the alternative. And if you're going to, like, just continue to debase me, then we're just going to flee, right? Capital is just going to seamlessly transition. And the, the 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 thing is, you know, like China or, or a you know some, a country that's maybe like authoritarian or or communist or whatever, they can they can close their capital markets and say, nope, you can't leave, right? If you want to be the global reserve currency, you cannot close your capital markets. And I think that's what people are starting. That's why there's been such an embrace of Bitcoin in the past few years by you know what people would say is the establishment. Even, you know, like the, the Trump campaign, you know, if you think about what J.D. Vance and Trump's platform is, is we need we need to reshore manufacturing. We need to weaken the dollar. And they're also, you know, bull posting about Bitcoin. Mm. Those things aren't unrelated. Right. We need to reonshore our manufacturing. We're going to throw tariffs on everybody. We're going to weaken the dollar. That's what you need to do to reonshore re manufacturing. We're going to weaken the dollar relative to China and Japan and, and Singapore and and Indonesia and blank, blank, blank. And Bitcoin is part of the policy platform. Why? Well, it's not just the fact that there's now like crypto lobbying money. It's the fact that like, you know, the Peter, the Peter Thiel types and like those, you know, kind of Silicon Valley types know that in that, in that world, there's going to be an escape. There's going to be a liquidity valve. There's going to be kind of this like, you know, this, this, um, yeah, this, this liquidity, you know, check. And Bitcoin is that thing. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I, I wouldn't be surprised in a world where if we're 50 years from now, Bitcoin, I mean, I, I sort of kind of expect Bitcoin to be this store value, medium exchange, unit of account. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, I, the monopoly on state, uh, the monopoly on violence and the, the reality of the state, I don't think collapses. And I would have, I would have said, I would think that four years ago, um, someone's going to be controlling the new codes. Some, you know, someone's going to have the, the, the bombers and whatnot. That doesn't stop Bitcoin from existing. Um, but what that does mean is that there is, a, there is somewhere, you know, along the chain, uh, kind of a control of, of, of violence and a control of um, the state of affairs. And so does that, can that all operate without a, a fiat currency? Well, I guess that's a big question. Um, but what I do think Bitcoin being super valuable means is that at least the relative level of that power gets checked, gets put in its place. And so I think that the, the size of the bureaucratic state and the, the EU and DC and, you know, like I think that the, the power that they have relatively gets, gets shrunken um, by that. I don't think it goes away completely. Hmm. It's interesting because the, the, before I started the podcast, I also thought, oh, fiat will be gone. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like fiat will be gone in, within a few years or maybe like a decade or something like that. 
and the more I speak with Bitcoin, as the more realistic my view on, on the actual thing gets. And uh, that I, I, right now, like I, I think it might be possible in the future if we uh, think of like very far out. Uh, but I don't think I will see that in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we, we get to a state where we can upload our identity, but <laughs> that's a whole another discussion. But if we think of a normal lifetime, I think that will not happen. Um, before we come to the end routine, one last question. You mentioned it. Uh, how big, or like if at all, will the, the US election impact anything in Bitcoin? I feel like when I talk with some Bitcoiners, they're like, oh, when Trump wins, that and that happens. But at the same time, like, I don't know, like we had a Kamala Harris administration already because she's the vice president. Yeah. Uh, and Bitcoin went OK the last four years. Yep. Will the, there be any uh, fundamental change to, I don't know, Bitcoin price, to the to, to regulatory frameworks or policies in America, whether Trump or Harris wins? Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, I mean, Trump's more of a bullish candidate. Um, I think there would be some form of, I don't know if you'd want to call it strategic reserve or not, um, but I, I think it's more. it was more than just lip service, um, despite how, you know, I was, I was there in Nashville for the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, it was more of a standard Trump rally than it was a Bitcoin maximalist manifesto. Like, I mean, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that um, it would be super bullish. The fact, I think really it's more the fact that the potential, I mean, the previous and the potential future leader of the free world, uh, Donald Trump is, I mean, and, and he tweets a lot of things, but he's, you know, posting on Truth Social, which evidently gets seen by everybody everywhere. Um, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining uh, needs to stay in America. We need our energy independence and we can't let our enemies and our, you know, our geostrategic uh, or our, our geopolitical um, adversaries have it. And so if you think about it, like I, it was interesting. I was on a Twitter spaces with Matthew Pines, um, who's a, uh, you know, national security, uh, consultant advisor, um, and talk, and kind of does a lot of this geopolitical game theory and talks about great powers and whatnot. And he was saying, do you guys realize that, that, you know, off the, off the hip truth social post at 1am was circulated by every intelligence agency on the planet? Hmm. Like, like. You know the people that are game planning. You know the the con or not a conflict, but the you know that are in China's intelligence agencies or that are in I you know Iranian and Russian intel are are saying what did he just say? Like and so that e even if Trump loses, even if you know that just that conversation didn't exist four years ago. I mean maybe maybe like on the fringes, right? But at a trillion dollars, uh, you know, at the, with how big and robust the mining industry is. Um, I think people realize that, like you know, Bhutan is, has like half their GDP in Bitcoin reserves, mm -hmm. right? Like I, I, they have like thirteen thousand Bitcoin, or I think it's like a quarter of their GDP um, per year they have just on, on Bitcoin hodled on their balance sheet, right? So like that's for small nations, but for big nations, for for Russia who just cut off SWIFT, you don't think they've they've evaluated every alternative? You don't think that they've they're already covertly accepting Bitcoin or maybe even have a little bit of a stash. Um, so in terms of the election, I think that, I mean, Trump's obviously more of a pro Bitcoin candidate. Um, the rhetoric itself is super meaningful. Potential for a strategic reserve or just not selling the Bitcoin they acquired is, is huge. Um, I honestly think that it would be the, the if in, a, in a Harris administration or a Trump administration, it's, it's, there's a bigger relative impact on crypto I would say like Bitcoin has solidified itself. It's a commodity. The SEC has no jurisdiction. If Kamala wins, like crypto is going, I, I would, you know, is going to be, there's going to be a lot of, you know, fall, fallback um, from that, you know, secure. It's just like the securities regulation and all that stuff. Kind of the hammer is going to come down, I would say um, more so relatively than, than Trump. Um, and like, I'm, you know, I'm a bit agnostic to it all. Um, I'm, you know, I don't really care or focus my time on altcoins, but, um, I mean, it's obvious like the Trump sphere of influence is literally launching like a fork mm. of DeFi on Aave. Like, I think it's, I think it's stupid. Um, you know, that doesn't really like change my overall opinion on many things, but like if Trump gets in, like it's more or less free game. Um, for better or worse, 
um, on on that stuff. Because like if he doesn't, then like you, they're absolutely going to bring about charges against World Liberty Coin or whatever else, right? Like obviously yeah. that's just that the state of political affairs. Um, and so I think it's it's more relatively impactful, despite I think it being somewhat kind of irrelevant long term. The ex Bitcoin crypto uh, bucket, uh, I think it's relatively more important for crypto than it is for Bitcoin. Uh, but I think it still is wild, like you know wildly important and impactful. Or Bitcoin itself, because I think, you know, once he gets in that we're going to have like, you know, there's going to be some Bitcoiners like in the cabinet. We're going to have, you know, eyes on the inside. And I think the rhetoric is going to continue to be strong. Um, but either way, I think this was the this was the first time Bitcoin, even if it was still a minor issue, it was, you know, at, at the big rallies or at the debates, there was no talk of Bitcoin. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was never once mentioned in 2020. Um, so I think by 2028, there will be sort of a bipartisan consensus that this is important, this shouldn't go away. And it's one, because the size of the voting bloc, but, but more importantly, I would say, this is just the reality of politics. Uh, it's the, 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 just how big of a, a punch uh, the crypto lobby packs in terms of donations. Mm. I mean, it's, like, it's just like a, a disproportionate outsized amount of, of funding um, from the, the Bitcoin crypto lobby. And so like, if we're thinking about 2028, even if let's just say we're at sixty-two thousand dollars, but I don't think we are in terms of Bitcoin's price. Um, I mean that this is a one-way street, right? It's the and I think also importantly enough, like for me, for you, the orange pill journey. Like once you realize like the the game theory and the 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 kind of the the motion that's already in place uh, for Bitcoin adoption, you know, you realize like or your mental model completely wipes away that like oh it's going to zero argument. But for a lot of people, like they're thinking about this and they're like, well, it could go to zero, right? And I think that what this has done in the minds of a lot of people, a lot of baby boomers, maybe Trump supporters, whatever, is like this probability distribution, like the left tail outcome of like zero, like wipe that off, cut it off, you know? And then how do you value Bitcoin if it, well, it could be zero dollars per coin or it could be 10 million, but we don't know. How do you value that if the left tail is is cut off, Mm. right? And so, like, for me or you, the left tail argument of, oh, Bitcoin goes to zero wasn't, hasn't been a, a something that we realistically thought about forever. You know, it just, it's just like, oh, yeah, it's a dumb argument. But for a lot of people, that was like, in, whether they understood it or not, that was their thinking. And so when you see Bitcoin, you know, being this mainstream, maybe looking to 2028, it's going to be bipartisan consensus. Governments aren't banning it. It's not going to zero. What does that mean? Um, and so that's, I think that's really the, the thing that I've been excited about is like Trump wins, Kamala wins, like, you know, it, there's a lot of other issues outside of Bitcoin or crypto that I think I, I even think about more. Um, mm. but I think, you know, Trump would be good, but either way, I, it doesn't, you know, a, a Harris administration doesn't stop Bitcoin from yeah. reaching six figures plus. Yeah. I think that's a, that's an important, uh, important, uh, message here. Um, really cool. Then let's come to the end routine. I have one question that is always the same for every guest and then one question from a previous guest. The first question that is always the same. What can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? Wow, that's a that's a great question. Um, um, I would just say that, um, you know, one of the things that I've, um, you know, in, in the past four years, but really like my my um, my my life is I've I've always uh, had a hunger and curiosity to, of, of, to learn. Um, you know, part of the reason I dropped out of school was because I was, you know, I was always learning, like scrolling my phone online, reading books. Um, and, and there wasn't, it was, I think it was sort of a naive belief, but there was this kind of belief that like, I could, I can learn whatever, you know, it, like, I, I don't care what my business school teaches me or, or, you know, my teacher says or doesn't like, I can go, I can go figure out anything. Um, and so, that I think again is sort of the naive young belief, but I think there, especially in the information world, um, I think that um, I wouldn't put a limit on what you can do or what you can learn, um, especially in this you know current current age, right? Whether you want to be a uh, you know computer science a computer scientist or a coder, or whether you want to be a writer or whatever, like you have you have all of the tools out there. You know, if you want to start a podcast, do it. If you want to if you want to like do whatever, do it. Right. And you, you, you don't need validation. And also, 
you know, at, at first you don't need anybody to say you can or can't do it. And also like, you know, basically all of the tools and resources for you to learn or do anything are basically out there already. You know, there, there's not really any walled gardens anymore of like, in terms of information or in terms of just like the tools required to basically to, to do or, or uh, learn whatever you want. Um, mm. And so, and that, I think that's some, to a certain extent has always been the case, right? It's just like, you know, just, just shoot high and see what you can do. But now, especially in like this information age, you can quite literally almost learn anything, you know? It's like all information's abundant and everywhere. And so, you know, for me, that's, that's sort of been something that was instilled upon me early on, but it's also the past four or five years, um, you know, I couldn't have, I couldn't have imagined what I'd be doing, you know, and if, for here today in 2020, but it was just, and there wasn't even an end goal in mind, right? It was just like, you know, it was just a hunger for like, I don't know, I don't know what that is. Let me look it up. Like, I, I'm gonna go read this. I'm gonna, oh, this person is really smart. I wanna listen to them. Um, and so, you know, that's something I always, I think about is that like, it's, yeah, there's always this, there's, there's this reach for wanting something to, to have it now or to know it now or to like have it all figured out. And the reality is like, everybody's kind of making it up on the fly. And so, you know, it's just kind of just, if you can just be 1% better every day, I know that's cliche, um, but if you can just learn one new thing or, you know, just, you know, do, do something you did do yesterday or read that next chapter, like the, the, those compounding gains over a long time um, really add up. So for me, you know, some, someone that just loves to learn, um, it's been uh, that mindset and that, uh, that reality has been, you know, has, has changed my life in many ways. So I think that outside of Bitcoin and maybe I'm applying it to like the, the journey I've had in the Bitcoin space, but, um, you know, a, that, that just daily progress, that daily hunger and drive on a, on a, you know, six month, one year, four year time frame, like you can't imagine where, where you'll be, you know, you couldn't have imagined being 280 podcast episodes in yeah. after your first one. Right. And, you know, having having on like the biggest name in Bitcoin with Michael Saylor and getting 100,000 views like, you know, when you were first thinking of your podcast, you couldn't even imagine that. Right. But it was like it was just that daily showing up, editing, like, you know, when no when no one was watching the podcast, but you were showing up. Right. So I think that's that's a kind of a uh, something that is supersedes Bitcoin or supersedes, you know, what we're doing right now. And it's just more of like a. A, a, a good attitude to have for life. Absolutely, I 100% agree. As as the podcast also uh, shows for me, I just basically started it like not even 11 months ago, uh, and Insane. Uh, was on uh, on the stage on in Amsterdam. I loved it so much. Really cool. Um, the last question uh, is from previous guests. So like the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually nice. is, uh, and he asked you, if not Bitcoin, what would you invest your money in? <laughs> yeah, I would. I mean, it'd probably be a mix of like, I would say, you know, gold as crazy as it is, um, as well as just like uh, tech. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I, funny enough, I bought, I bought a one ounce gold coin in COVID. Um, I was, mm. I was, I was all, all in Bitcoin almost, but I was like, you know, sound money, hard money. I'll, I'll pay some <laughs> homage to it. And I bought a gold coin. I sold it like six months later for less Bitcoin. I was like, oh gosh. Um, but it was that, and uh, yeah, it'd probably be a, you know, I, I, I'm really interested in tech and all the AI stuff. And, um, so yeah, I think it would be that, but, um, you know, for now my investing framework's pretty, pretty boring, pretty simple. Um, just stack as much Bitcoin and maybe some Bitcoin proxies as, as possible. Very really, really cool. Thank you so much for, for being on before I let you go. Where can people find you? I saw that you also have a YouTube channel actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, you can find me on Twitter at, at Dylan LeClaire underscore. Um, I have a YouTube channel, but I actually haven't posted on it in like, I did like six episodes and then I, I joined, um, I joined MetaPlanet and over in Japan. And so I've been working late hours and, um, you know, ha haven't done something like that in a while. So I'll probably post again. Um, yeah. but if you want to subscribe there, that's cool too. Uh, but mostly on Twitter. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you having me on. It's been a lot of fun. Really cool. Uh, thank you so much, Dylan, for, for being on. Cheers. Uh, also, thank you so much for everyone watching and listening. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.